Greetings students and welcome back to my second video on differential geometry. In this lesson we're going to start by talking about the concept of arc length. In the previous video we showed that a parametrized curve gamma could be defined as a vector valued function which takes in the real scalar t and puts out a vector in Rn given by gamma 1 of t, gamma 2 of t, all the way till gamma n of t. Because gamma is an n-dimensional vector. As mentioned, t is a real number, and in many cases the curve we define is finite, and what that means is that t is constrained to lie between two constants alpha and beta, which are also real numbers. We also discussed in the previous video how intuitively we can think of the parameter t as the time, and as time increases we can actually trace out the path of the parametrized curve. Now suppose we have a parametrized curve gamma, and this is what it looks like. This is a finite curve with the left endpoint corresponding to a parameter value of alpha and the right endpoint corresponding to a parameter value of beta. Suppose I wanted to find the length of this curve, also known as the arc length, from alpha to beta. How would I do that? Well, I would take two points on the curve, one at gamma of t and another very close by at gamma of t plus delta t. If I zoom into the part of the curve between these two points, I'll find that the path between gamma of t and gamma of t plus delta t basically looks like a straight line. Since gamma of t and gamma of t plus delta t represent vectors, remember that gamma is a vector valued function, this straight line in between the two will represent the vector given by gamma of t plus delta t minus gamma of t. The length of the short path defined by this vector will then be the magnitude of this vector. If we want the length of the entire curve, then we'll have to sum all these little lengths over the entire curve. To do that more easily, we'll divide the length of this short path by delta t and then multiply it by delta t. What happens to this quantity as we let delta t approach zero, as we let the two adjacent points get closer and closer? Well, using the definition of the derivative, it approaches the magnitude of the derivative of gamma t, gamma dot t, times dt, where dt is an infinitesimally small version of delta t. Now as mentioned earlier, I need to sum all of these little lengths over the entire curve in order to get the arc length, and the main way to perform the summation is to integrate the magnitude of gamma dot t with respect to t. Note that the integral goes from alpha to beta because we're integrating over the parameter t, and alpha and beta are the extreme values of t on either end of the curve. And this discussion brings us to the definition of arc length. The arc length of a curve gamma starting at the point gamma of alpha is the function s of t given by s of t is the integral from alpha to t of the magnitude of gamma dot at u du. This definition should make sense from your basic physics courses. If gamma is supposed to represent the path a particle traverses as a function of time, then the derivative of gamma with respect to time would be the particle's velocity. And if you integrate the magnitude of that velocity, in other words if you integrate the speed of the particle with respect to time, you should end up with a distance as your final answer. And that's what we get here. Integrating the speed gives us the length of the curve, the length of the path the particle traveled. This physics intuition leads us to another concept in differential geometry, the idea of speed. If gamma is a parametrized curve going from alpha to beta, then its speed at a point t is given by the magnitude of its derivative at t. This is basically what we just discussed. Now along with speed is the idea of a unit speed curve. Gamma is a unit speed curve if its derivative with respect to time if the velocity is a unit vector throughout the curve. In other words, the speed everywhere along gamma is equal to 1. Here's a quick and easy theorem related to speed that we'll now prove. Suppose I have a smooth unit speed curve given by gamma of t, so a unit speed curve that is infinitely differentiable. If that's the case, the dot product of gamma dot and gamma double dot is zero. The proof of this theorem is pretty trivial. If gamma is a unit speed curve, then it should make sense that the magnitude of the velocity gamma dot is one. This is just the definition of the unit speed curve. This means that the magnitude squared must also be 1. And we know from linear algebra that the magnitude squared of a vector is just the dot product of that vector with itself. If we differentiate both sides with respect to t, we'll get 0 on the right, and we'll get gamma double dot, dot gamma dot, plus gamma dot, dot product gamma double dot on the left, using the product rule of differentiation. Since the dot product is commutative, we can combine the terms on the left and get 2 times gamma dot, 
dot product with gamma double dot, which means that gamma dot dot gamma double dot is zero, which completes the proof. The implication of this theorem is that if I have a particle traveling at a constant speed, like a speed of one, for instance, the acceleration of that particle is either equal to zero or it's perpendicular to the velocity of that particle, which is what happens in rotational motion. In rotational motion, the speed of the particle stays constant, but it's still accelerating because its direction is changing and the acceleration is normal to the direction of travel. By the way, I've labeled this theorem one, and the reason for that is that throughout this series, I'm going to be referring back to theorems on occasion. This just makes things easier for future reference. Let's go over another important concept in differential geometry called reparametrization. Say we have a curve gamma of t, where t ranges from alpha to beta. In some cases, we might want to change the parameter from t to t bar to get a curve gamma bar, where t bar varies from alpha bar to beta bar. This process is called reparametrizing, which leads me to the definition of a reparametrized curve. A parametrized curve gamma bar is a reparametrization of gamma if there is a smooth bijective or one-to-one -one map phi which converts t bar to t, such that the inverse map phi inverse which converts t to t bar is also smooth, and gamma bar can be expressed as gamma phi of t bar for all t bar in the open interval between alpha bar and beta bar. Note that because we're working with a bijective map phi with a smooth inverse, this also means that gamma can be thought of as a reparametrization of gamma bar. Now this is quite a lot of math jargon to take in, so let me put things into context with an example. Suppose I have a circle of radius 1 given by x squared plus y squared equals 1. One way to parametrize this curve is to use gamma of t equals cosine t comma sine t, where t is between 0 and 2 pi. This should be pretty easy to understand. If we take cosine squared plus sine squared, we'll get 1, just like how x squared plus y squared equals 1 is the equation of our circle. However, we can switch the order of the sine and cosine to end up with another parametrization that works equally well. Because sine and cosine are just phase shifted relative to each other, we can write our reparametrization map as t equals phi of t bar, which is pi by 2 minus t bar. Note that this reparametrization map is bijective, it's one to one. Every value of t bar corresponds to a unique value of t, and every value of t corresponds to a unique value of t bar. This map is also smooth, because it's just a linear function, it can easily be differentiated. Finally, it also has a smooth inverse. If we isolate t bar, we'll get another linear function, which by virtue of being linear is also smooth. Let's move to our final definitions in this video of regular and singular. Again, we'll have gamma be our parametrized curve. Now, a regular point of gamma is one where the derivative of gamma is not zero. A singular point is one where the derivative is zero, so the velocity at that point is zero. Finally, the entire curve gamma is called a regular curve if all of its points are regular. So that should cover our quick definitions. Let me explain the rationale behind reparametrization. In some cases, we want to find a reparametrization that converts a curve to a unit speed curve. If we can find such a reparametrization, that would be really convenient because as it turns out, unit speed curves are very easy to deal with in differential geometry. Anyway, that should do it for this lecture. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher. I've linked my Patreon account in the description for you to check out. And that's it. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.